So I would like to welcome everyone uh, to the latest in our guest speaker series. Um, a quick reminder that the format is uh, roughly half an hour for the talk and about half an hour for, for questions and discussion. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce our speaker, Professor Philip Sheltons. Um, but first of all, by way of introduction for Prof Sheltons to OBD, uh, we're a company spun out from Oxford University. Uh, we have a technology that takes measures of the brain uh, from MRI that are based on changes in uh, cellular structure. Uh, we work with uh, researchers, uh, pharma and biotech to support drug development and help uh, clinicians personalize care by assisting uh, detection of Alzheimer's disease, dementia and other brain disorders. Uh, so that's that's enough about us. Now I'm very happy to, uh, Professor Sheltons has joined us today. He is Professor of Neurology and Director of the Alzheimer Centre at, uh, at the VU University Medical Centre of Amsterdam. Uh, he's a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and most recently Chair of the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. So we look forward, uh, Professor Sheltons, to hearing about your work on dementia, perhaps your thoughts on latest developments in terms of new treatments, of course, uh, and uh, maybe yeah. view, view of biomarkers in clinical practice. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. It's an honor to uh, to address uh, you all, and uh, and I'm very intrigued by your company. I got the, the pitch from the company a couple of weeks ago, and hence I was lured into this talk, but uh, it's a pleasure to do it. But <laughs> It's uh, so I was actually you mentioned the word precision and that's actually the talk that I chose to to do today. Uh, OK, so I, I have uh, actually uh, it intrigues me a lot. Uh, precision medicine and now an Alzheimer's disease. And I think it's it's all because of the fact of the biomarkers. And that's why I have um, I, I think it, it's appropriate to uh, to uh, give the talk on this topic uh, today. Um, and I will do it in 30 minutes and then we have a lot of time for questions and I will address some of the issues that you mentioned. Uh, just before uh, I will show you my disclosures and you can see that uh, the Alzheimer's Center that I direct already for more than 20 years has a lot of uh, external funding uh, for several, several sources. I do a lot of consultancy from uh, sometimes ad hoc to a longer uh, time uh, sort of commitments. Uh, I'm also very much involved in, in trials. I like doing trials a lot, so I'm a PI of the uh, AC immune, which is a vaccine against tau. Uh, UCB is a monoclonal antibody against tau. Fivorion is a German company, has a uh, small molecule against a pyroglue A beta, a very toxic form of A beta, and, uh, and several others. Um, so this is um, what I would like to address. So precision is a um, I think it's a term that comes from oncology, and if you uh, if you sort of look at the at the word precision, I think it comes in in many flavors. You can think of precision in terms of certain diagnostic types or subtypes, or the stage of the disease, or specific targets within, for instance, Alzheimer's disease, or specific types of interventions, or perhaps specific subgroups, like, uh, like groups of sort of um, uh, subdivided into age groups, for instance, or specific groups based on the genetic profile, for instance, APOE4, or, or uh, gender, which is also precision, uh, treatments developed only for one half of the population, for instance, or many, many more. So it comes in many, many flavors. And I think, first of all, I think, and I, I have sent you this seminar that I was happy to author uh, at the beginning of this year. Actually, uh, this was the uh, the fruit of Corona, I must say, because of the lockdown. We spent many, much more time at home than before, so I had time to do this with my colleagues. And you probably know Butter Stroper. He's uh, very well known in the UK as the director of the DRI, very dear friend of mine for a very long time already, and, uh, and uh, some of the others. And I think uh, what for me has is, is sort of has been a, a very yeah critical point in time um, as as a shift in the concept of of Alzheimer's disease and dementia and how we think about this uh, this disease has been in 2018. Uh, and I, I won't go into all of the history, but it actually started in 2007 with incorporating biomarkers into the clinical and research diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. First, in a very sort of yeah, um, subtle attempt to incorporate MRI and CSF and to talk about prodromal AD instead of MCI. But in 2018, it's actually sort of yeah, completely turned over and turned around in the sense that we then decided, and I was 
largest member of this uh, AI uh, Alzheimer's Association and the NIA working group to say, well, let's let's sort of um, uh, do it the other way around and let's diagnose Alzheimer's disease on the basis of biomarkers only. And that means that you will talk about Alzheimer's disease, and this is a research framework, but as it always goes, these research frameworks or guidelines, they they gradually sort of yeah, find their way into clinical practice as well. Uh, but, but here we define the disease on the basis of the presence of amyloid and tau and uh, regardless of the presence of neurodegeneration. And if there is only amyloid and no tau, we talk about Alzheimer's pathophysiology. If there's no amyloid and no tau and no neurodegeneration, it's normal. And anything that has no amyloid, so T plus and N uh, plus or minus, we call non-AD. And this is actually a real sort of yeah, a sh a shift in thinking. Uh, and a lot of people have, have great difficulty with accepting it. But for me, it, it was really important because I've always thought that Alzheimer's disease would be a continuum. And now we have shown that you can have Alzheimer's disease when you're completely normal. As we have with oncology, you can have carcinoma in situ. You don't know, you're not aware of it, that somewhere there you have no complaints at all. And this is the same if you have amyloid and tau in the brain, you can completely cognitively normal, you can function normally, but you still have Alzheimer's disease. And this and actually sort of gradually goes into a stage that we still call mild cognitive impairment or any other term you would like to use. And, and this is most important, dementia is now only used as a, as a, a word to identify the stage and no longer the disease because the disease is defined by biomarkers and the stage is either normal or mild cognitive impairment or dementia or anything in between. And that sort of disentangles dementia from Alzheimer's disease, which is really very important. Now, uh, in this particular paper, and you, you should look it up, but there's also a very difficult scheme in sort of clinical staging. And this is less, less interesting uh, instead of sort of that we still maintain these terms and we match them to the ATN profiles, etc. And there's also a stage one to six, I won't go into that, but it's only to 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 hallmark and to mark the the important year 2018 in which we made this shift and we are now thinking uh, differently about what is Alzheimer's disease, I would say. Uh, and I think um, this is now finally translated into the, the world of clinical trials. Uh, and I think many of the failures in the past can be attributed to the fact that people were included in the trials based on their clinical diagnosis only and not using the biomarkers to the full extent. And we know that clinical diagnosis is often incorrect. And uh, this uh, Lily example is, is, is a very nice example of where the, the patients were actually tweaked and, and precisely diagnosed on the basis of the presence of amyloid and tau positivity, but not everybody who was tau positive because there was also a cap on the amount of tau and this is to me approach to a sort of precision medicine within the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease. You target only those individuals who have amyloid and a limited amount of tau and this was particularly successful in that sense that it is as uh, they saw a very nice reduction on amyloid PET of, of amyloid burden as we see with all the monoclonal antibodies and in this specific study there was also a, 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 a sort of a positive endpoint in the sense of a combined cognitive functional scale which was used as the primary endpoint. So again a nice example of, of a sort of precision approach in a clinical trial in Alzheimer's disease. Um, I would also say that uh, there are many other, uh, and this is of course the argument always against the ATN, is that there are so many other pathologies as well uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And this always comes from pathologists. And this is because they see the disease at the end stage. Uh, elderly people, as you can see, the age of death is always above 75 years of age. And then of course, and we all know this, you have many more pathologies. That doesn't say that they don't have Alzheimer's disease, but they have Alzheimer's disease plus something else. Now the nice things, uh, nice thing about these pathologies is that you can of course detect them uh, post-mortem, but there are also ways to detect them pre-mortem. And I will list here a few of the of the most important ones. Uh, CAA, which is chondrophilic angiopathy, um, amyloid angiopathy, which is in the vessels, which can be seen on MRI as, as uh, micro hemorrhages and sometimes even um, 
uh, sort of uh, yeah uh, aria which is not really aria but then uh, vasogenic edema for instance or or superficial hemosiderosis for instance and that's a, and that's maybe a signal for copathology meaning amyloid in the vessels or um, what we now see, call a late is a syndrome that has uh, no amyloid but has a lot of TDP43 pathology and sometimes also amyloid. And these um, Im these uh, sort of patients can be categorized based on their huge amount of hippocampal atrophy, which is actually um, sort of not uh, not in line with the rest of the brain atrophy. Is actually over. Um, uh, exaggerated amount of hippocampal atrophy. Uh, DLB, Lewy body dementia, uh, we can now detect during life based on the DOT scan, of course, and in using CSF, you see in many of the DLB patients that 50% of them have actually also co-pathology of Alzheimer's disease, so vice versa. And in general, I would say vascular comorbidity, which is the most prevalent in elderly people, you can also detect using MRI. And this is where MRI actually came in in the early 80s, 90s, detecting vascular changes and lacking like infarcts, extremely useful. And another way of uh, sort of precising the sort of patient you want to have in your clinical trial and in your research project with or without a certain amount of white matter changes or vascular damage in general, MRI is perfect for that. And that's another way to tweak the population or to precisely define the population that you need to target. Um, and this is uh, sort of uh, another way of, of, of uh, precising or, or narrowing the, the patient population, which is Alzheimer's disease, which is a hugely prevalent disease with ages that start from 40 to over 100. Uh, and they have all stages, as you can know, but this is not very useful for a clinical trial program, for instance. So you can see that you can subdivide these patients into a preclinical population meaning patients only identified by biomarkers and no clinical symptoms at all. And I think that will be the majority of the studies that we will see in the future. Uh, or MCI prodromal patients or mild AD, dementia patients or mild to moderate AD, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just a breakdown of a very recent overview. You see that almost half of the trials currently being done involves actually pre-dementia patients. So before the dementia stage, and this is also an important uh, sort of uh, precision approach. Um, and, and you can see that the current amyloid beta targeted drugs in phase two and three clinical trials are actually in these earlier stages and we go earlier and earlier. Uh, the red ones here are uh, discontinued already, but you can see that many of those are still continuing. I would say the most most promising ones are the BAN2401 or Lecanumab, as you know. This is the early AD clarity study and of course also Donanimab, which is the Trailblazer 2. We're now in phase three, also targeting very early AD or even, to, um, yeah, or sometimes even mild AD. You can see here active vaccination also with a beta, etc. So it's all it's all about early AD. So that's that's a subcategorization of the Alzheimer's disease population. And uh, I would also say that precision medicine, as I said earlier, can also be uh, in the form of uh, different targets. So not only amyloid, not only tau, but perhaps uh, different uh, targets. Uh, interesting targets like synaptic dysfunction or uh, genetic factors, I'll talk about it later a little bit, inflammation, microglia activation, TREM2, uh, aging of the cell, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, diversity in therapeutic approaches. So we have seen monoclonal antibodies, we have seen vaccinations so active uh, immune therapy, but now and more and more we see attempts for gene therapy, Antisense therapy, very important and promising program of Ionis, for instance, antisense tau therapy, currently ongoing. Uh, small molecules, as I said, the Fivorion approach and RNA interference, stem cell therapy even. I, I know one company at least that is working on stem cell therapy. So there's a lot of diversity, I would say, in targets and interventions. And this can also be sort of yeah, um, seen under the umbrella of, uh, of uh, precision medicine, I would say. <clears throat> as you can see, uh, as we always think that amyloid and tau are the most sort of predominant targets in Alzheimer's disease trials. This is not no longer true. Uh, as you can see, this is a, a very recent overview, phase one, phase two, phase three trials, that a lot of the phase two actually are not, not targeting tau or a beta, but synaptic plasticity, neuroprotection, and importantly also inflammation and immunity. So this, these are the, the targets for the future, and we will see hopefully that these phase two programs will also translate in phase three programs.
So different targets, different ways of, uh, of administration. Uh, this is Tao, uh, just an overview, and um, this is by far uh, complete, uh, just showing you the red ones are discontinued, but the ones that are most promising are the AAD VAC1, which is Axel Neuroscience. They just published their phase two results in nature aging. I was a part of that group, and of course, and although they didn't really include the right sort of proper population of patients, they, they just didn't apply all the biomarks at the beginning. They had some very interesting outcomes uh, on biomarks with the vaccine and I think uh, the better ones at this time are the AC35 from AC Immune together with the Roche and also the uh, UCB program uh, and, and the Biogen and Johnson & Johnson program. Um, so a lot of things going on in EBEDA and Tau and inflammation and etc etc and all sort of uh, targeting different uh, approaches. One thing that I find very interesting is also to uh, look within the and uh, using the biomarkers or using uh, such a thing as age at onset is to look at different populations, uh, particularly relevant for clinical trials. And uh, you, of course, know about the Diane, the uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, autosomal dominant population. They carry a PS1 or APP or even PS2 mutation. They are usually very young, but they find that they are a real example of a very targeted, uh, precise population that has only one pathology, only a beta at the beginning, and uh, you can you can track these patients very early on already. But uh, outside of that particular population, which is quite rare, you have a larger population that is also early onset, so onset before 65 years of age, which is also a pure population. They have much less vascular changes on MRI, for instance. They much more often have an atypical presentation, so their MRI may show posterior cortical atrophy or left dominant atrophy as the language variant, and they are non-familial. They often have APOE4, but not always, and this is a particularly fine population also for clinical trials. And this is in contrast to the typical late onset population of the 70 and 80 plus people that have an amnestic syndrome and uh, usually have uh, medial temporal atrophy, but also a lot of uh, comorbidity usually. So, and if you mix these two, then you get a very mixed population and you may lose your effect that you would have found either in one or the other population. So I'm a big fan of targeting certain populations and 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 also targeting populations who have less comorbidity as i showed earlier on and this is all possible because of the biomarkers that we have now this is such a rich environment if you compare it to other diseases that we have these biomarkers nowadays that we can do this in alzheimer's disease population it's actually really very uh, interesting and it's it's a it's a it's a real fascinating time to live in in alzheimer's disease uh, research at the moment uh, this is the picture that I took from the uh, from the seminar, and this was done by Henne Holstegen, just showing the the, the genetic landscape. And this is has been this has changed so much also over the over the last few years. Uh, we know, of course, all these PS1, PS2, APP. Now we know also another uh, causative uh, gene, which is SORL1. Uh, we also have now the TREM2, which is partly causative and also risk increasing heterogeneous population uh, and also uh, AB, uh, ABA7, which is sort of, yeah, um, really risk increasing over, overall, uh, but not that prevalent, as you can see here. Same goes for TREM2, by the way. Uh, and this is the more prevalent sort of uh, genes that are that you can find more often. And these are all in the risk uh, sort of increasing space. Most importantly is, of course, APOE4, which is quite prevalent and has a very high uh, increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, but there are others and there are many others, actually. And all of these may or may not be targets for uh, drug treatment. And this is why this, this whole field is now so interesting, because there are many more leads and many more um, interesting compounds so i know of companies that were that work to with uh, targets like cd3 3 uh, cd33 or pcom sorry about that uh, pcom for instance uh, and we in amsterdam are particularly interested also in the protective variants so uh, we have discovered the pclg2 variant which is a protective genetic uh, variant present in centenarians that had actually Alzheimer's disease pathology, but were not demented. 
so these patients have something that pre pre prevents them from getting demented. Uh, same goes here with the Icelandic variant, of course, which is an APP variant. These patients do not even develop Alzheimer's disease pathology. And of course, APOE2, we know also as a risk as a risk reducing variant. So there are also uh, very interesting therapies focusing on APOE4, APOE3 and APOE2, um, which I show here. Uh, this is actually, it's a little bit of a blurry slide, but just to show that APOE4 that we know already since 1993 as being an important risk factor, but APOE2 is actually a protective factor. So why not change, why not try to change the sort of uh, the, the, yeah the, the apoe4 as a risk factor into apoe2 or uh, trying to modify that risk by uh, changing ex vivo or in vivo apoe4 genotype into apoe2 or apoe3 and there are many attempts uh, sort of compensate the loss and enhance the neuroprotective function uh, inside and outside the body that we are currently looking at at the moment so there's a lot of activity there and it makes most sense and i think the most important sort of yeah activity is found around TREM2. Many companies focus on TREM2. You have seen the Elector program perhaps and also the MUNA program recently. They all focus on TREM2 as an important part of the of the cascade in the inflammatory uh, uh, sort of uh, so and, and also the cellular changes that take place before a beta pathology uh, aggregates. Um, I would say uh, this is just not to plug this particular paper, but it's because I like it a lot and it's it's Jeff Cummings actually who who designed it. But it's it's so interesting to take this precision approach uh, and to just have whenever you see a new trial, you see whether they have ticked the boxes for the five rights. And these are all yeah, sort of very straightforward and almost open door uh, statements. Uh, and of course, but but many of these statements have not been taken into account in previous trials and hence they failed. But we think and we have proposed that if you take this into account in your phase two, then you will de-risk the um, uh, your failure uh, rate uh, in phase three. So we're talking about the right target. Um, do you know that the target is valid in this particular disease? For instance, is there genetic uh, mechanism underpinning this target? Um, have, do you have the right drug? Does it penetrate the blood-brain barrier, for instance? Uh, do you have a dose response demonstrated in your earlier phases? Um, the, the biomarkers, extremely important. The right biomarkers for patient selection and target engagement and outcomes as well. And I think this is probably the most important right. And this is the one that actually is nowadays viewed upon in phase two as the most important uh, to select the partic particular participant, of course, as I showed you with the Lilly trial, but also to show target engagement. But for instance, by lowering PTAU or by showing changes on amyloid PET, right participants, of course, again, uh, using biomarkers, but also setting the stage for the clinical stage, preclinical or clinical, uh, sort of mild to moderate, or perhaps even severe dementia. And of course, well, this is really an open door, well-powered and well-conducted uh, trials. But still, I mean, if you if you take every, every single sort of new drug trial that you see, and you just see whether they tick the five boxes, you're already sort of halfway your success. Um, this is just to, to show you that we are also thinking about doing clinical trials differently. Again, focusing on biomarker endpoints and biomarker readouts to make quick decisions. Uh, if the biomarker is positive, then go to clinical endpoints, for instance, and to test several uh, drugs at the same time and use the pool placebo group. And this is just the way um, now uh, sort of trials are being designed to also speed up the clinical trial uh, process, because if you go from phase one to phase two, phase three, before you know it, 10 years have passed and then you still uh, have no results. So we have to speed this up. Um, this is just to, to illustrate uh, what we are now so excited about or critical about is, as you, uh, <laughs> there are two camps I already uh, saw. Uh, this is, but again, a nice example of how a drug came about and why the decision was made to to go on with this particular compound. 
Uh, this is a compound that has a long history, uh, actually based in Switzerland by uh, Roger Nietzsche and Christopher Hock, designed at the University of Zurich, where they, they discovered that elderly professors over 90 years of age who were cognitively healthy had natural antibodies against A-beta and also against tau and TDP43, etc. And they isolated these natural occurring antibodies and they translated them into uh, human monoclonal antibodies with the help of Biogen. And this is, uh, for instance, aducanumab. And what, what I found my most striking and convinced me that there was an effect is actually the dose response curve here, already at 26 weeks and also more or so in 54 weeks. So dose response means that the drug is doing something. And the, the higher the dose, the lower the amount of amyloid that was present at one year's treatment. And this is, of course, a very nice image, but uh, this is just to illustrate that some people actually on the highest dose and some people even on the six milligram dose became normal on visual read of the amyloid PET scan, which is really important. Uh, this is, of course, a, a very difficult trial to interpret because it was stopped before, uh, because of futility in March 2019. In October 2019, it appeared to have an effect. But I think the most important effect over all the phase three trials was the amyloid lowering effect, which was present in both trials that were otherwise identical and they had the same effect on the biomarker, but they didn't have the same effect clinically. The eMERGE had, a, had an effect on the CDR, which is a clinical rating scale, a very crude rating scale, I must say, and only at 78 weeks, there was a significant difference between the treated group and the placebo group, which was not present in the other study. And that's where all the fuss became, uh, came about. Uh, of course, the decision ultimately in June 7 was made to, um, by the FDA to approve Aduhelm on the accelerated approval pathway. And I advise you to read the letter very carefully because I think the FDA actually did a very good job in explaining why they approved the drug and being very conscious about the fact that there was a lot of uncertainty about the drug's clinical benefits. So they, they actually acknowledged that. But they said Alzheimer's disease is a serious or life-threatening disease. And we have only one drug that proves an effect on a surrogate endpoint which is reasonably likely to predict the clinical benefit. And that's where the whole discussion is. How likely is that and how reasonable is that? And, uh, and, and as always, you have people who think that the glass is half full or half empty. I'm one of those that think I've seen all the research that we have done actually that's showing that having amyloid in our large populations, for instance, of subjective cognitive decline, uh, of that is 30% of the people that we see, 10% of them have already abnormal biomarkers at day one, and all of them decline. All of them with amyloid decline over time. So for me, there is no question that if you have amyloid in the brain, it's not good for you and you will decline. So I think this is really reasonably likely. And the fact that it wasn't found in the studies was that it was only done 18 months, which is very short. If you take the whole process of Alzheimer's disease 15 to 20 years before you start treatment, then you can't expect a huge effect in 18 months. But uh, so this is a highly complex data set. Uh, there were uncertainties regarding clinical benefits. They listened to the patient community and they think that uh, also uh, they have looked, of course, at donanumab and lecanumab, the studies that were done afterwards, they all had the same profound effect on amyloid uh, plaques. So I think it's an, a class effect, and I think we will see that other studies later on will have more clinical effect. So they decided ultimately that the, the benefits of this particular drug, we don't have to talk about costs here, but the, the benefit would outweigh the risk of the therapy. So. I, my view is that aducanumab actually should be used as a precision treatment. And a precision treatment in my mind means that you will of course treat patients only who are amyloid positive. I mean, otherwise there's no rationale to do so. That have limited tau pathology. I think what you have seen with the donanumab study uh, is that you have, uh, if you are early in the process and not too much neurodegeneration or not too much tau burden, you're probably more likely to respond. Uh, so that's the thing that you could actually use in your in your also clinical decision. I would say treat patients very early, so in stage two, three, which is sort of between subjective cognitive decline and MCI in. Uh, I think we should target APOE4 positive individuals for two reasons. 
first of all, they have shown the highest benefit in the clinical trials. I didn't show that, but it's in the dossier that you, if you look at the APOE4 carriers, um, that they actually show the biggest benefit. And of course, it's the largest population, and it is the population who we see most often. 60% of the patients with Alzheimer's disease is APOE4 positive. I would say, using MRI, that we should limit the vascular burden in order to prevent vascular damage. Uh, for instance, the microbleeds and for instance, the, the area is very much dependent on the pre-existent vascular changes and the pre-existent amyloid uh, uh, amyloid burden in the vessel. So you can also tweak that using your MRI. I would say the biggest need is probably in the patients between 50 and 80 years of age. Um, those are non-familial cases. There is dispute whether the familial cases should also be uh, treated and I think they deserve at least thinking about that. Uh, little comorbidity because it's it's a treatment that you have to do for at least a couple of years every four weeks so it's it's relatively healthy patients that you should uh, select and I would say that for now that's the interesting part of Audu Helm since it treats amyloids mostly you can now also include all those patients that were previously excluded from all the clinical trials because they didn't have a, a real memory problem so the language variants the frontal variants the the visual variants all of the variants of Alzheimer's disease can now be treated also clinically. So um, there is a lot of things to do. We in the Netherlands, we started the abort project. This is a public private consortium uh, in the Netherlands with a lot of partners aimed to prepare for a future in which AD is stopped before dementia has started. So we are actually already prefer preparing ourselves for a disease modifying treatment. And we know we have some time because the EMA has to make the decision still. And even after the EMA has, has decided positively, we have at least a year before we get the treatment. So we are sort of um, nationwide data collection and we're looking at outcomes already. We are looking at individualized risk profiles in order for us to learn more about what kind of patient population would actually benefit most from a disease modifying treatment and also evaluate the readiness of the Dutch healthcare system for these therapies. So you have to have MRI access, you have to have uh, PET access, et cetera, et cetera. So we are doing this project. Uh, we have just started this and this is my colleague Wiesje van der Vlier who has uh, initiated this uh, huge project. Um, so I will end here. Uh, I think the path to precision medicine AD is there. Um, I think we have to abandon the belief that AD is one single entity. There are so many subtypes clinically. There are so many biomarker subtypes as well. Uh, and there are so many sort of even uh, sort of age subtypes. So there are, this is, there will never be a drug that fits all patients. So we have to target specific subpopulations and we will ultimately end up with cocktails for subpopulations of AD. I think also what all the companies are staring themselves blind on is the huge market perspective, this zillion amount of patients. But I think if you really look at what these drugs, these very expensive drugs uh, are aiming to do, I think there's a relatively small population that actually uh, should be treated and not that whole population. So it needs to be sort of a reformulation of that huge market perspective, probably. So I would like to see more specific targets, other targets than amyloid, using biomarkers to select and deselect pathology and patients, uh, as I explained in the five rights. Um, clinical parameters uh, may also help. Uh, we haven't discussed that thoroughly, but you can also use several cognitive tests to select cognitive profiles in your patient populations. Also to select certain patients who may actually decline faster than other patients. Um, the five rights I've pitched already, and I think we can conclude that the dementia field is now where oncology was 15 years ago, and we uh, we are always behind, but we will catch up as soon as we have more funding and more people to work on AD uh, as soon as possible. So I will end here. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Philip, for, for an excellent overview and also for um, taking a clear position on some of some of the latest developments as well, which is really nice to see because I think in some of the public discussion, people are sort of sometimes hedging their bets, but I think you've come up with a really nice way of summarizing how you can imagine things being used in practice. Yeah. 
Um, so, so now we have the opportunity to uh, ask you some questions, and I, I would like to invite the team to uh, um, draw my attention, I guess, and 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 we'll have a few questions. I think. Is that Ian? He, I think Ian's just got in first. Hi, Ian. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I, so this the whole the whole uh, precision being such an important part of. Uh, what you were saying. Um, one of the things that I struggle with most um, when I think about trying to validate our biomarker and other biomarkers is um, uh, that we're validating it against cognitive testing, um, mm. which I, I I think is, uh, I find to be a, a little bit murky at times. Now, yeah. I've, I've spoken to people about this and many people say that cognitive testing sort of have, they have an, a, a feeling that the, the map is the territory in some ways and that cognitive testing Cognitive ability is what we are trying to save, and this is a, it's a fine ground truth. But I, I'm not sure I sort of I totally buy that. I'd, I'd like to see further. So, how do you think about how difficult it is to truly validate um, the effectiveness of a biomarker when we don't have uh, totally accurate ground truths to go on? Yeah. So I think you mean what is the gold standard to what you compare your your biomarker to? And I think that's a very valid point. Um, and yeah, to be very honest, there, there is none. I mean, I think many of the biomarkers have been validated against clinical diagnosis, but if you use the biomarkers for clinical diagnosis, we know that clinical diagnosis is far from gold and far from perfect. Um, I think ultimately what the biomarkers that, that uh, are amyloid PET and tau PET have been approved by FDA, for instance, by ultimately doing uh, experiments where it was validated against pathology. Uh, so late stage people just before they died, they had an amyloid scan and on the whole and behold, it really sort of correlated with the amount of plaques uh, after after death. Cognitive testing is is really murky. I would I would agree with that, uh, and I, I have never seen this as a, as as the gold or the truth of or uh, the gold standard in that sense. I think what is what is perhaps a better uh, way of looking at it is is decline. So there is the, the problem with, with this field is that if you do a cross-sectional measure on cognition, you will get such a huge vari variation. But within a population, if you look at predictors of decline, you are narrowing the field a little bit more. And I think what we ultimately need is two things, is biomarkers for pathology, which we have sort of gone a long way already. We have MRI for structural pathology. We have amyloid PET, we have tau PET. We have to have many more molecular diagnostics for the other proteinopathies. But the second thing we need is biomarkers for predicting ultimately decline. And I think that's been a, a real problem in our field that if you take the cross-sectional, all the Alzheimer patients that are amyloid positive, there is still a huge variability of whether they decline or not. Some people stay stable over a couple of years and some people decline. So what we ultimately need is better ways of, of, of predicting which people, with, who, who will really decline, because those will, are the people that you probably need to treat. You don't need to treat people who are not declining, perhaps even. So that's probably not an answer to your question, but it's, it's an attempt at least. Thank you so much. And just a very quick follow up. If you were to choose one of the things to to be able to predict, would it be cognitive testing? Would it be brain volume? Uh, like which one of the of the measures that we have would you like to be able to predict decline? Um, so which of the, the measures we have currently as, as a predictor of decline, which were? No, yes. if, as in if you were to if we were to produce a new measure that was going to predict decline in something, would yeah. you prefer to see decline in cognitive testing scores or would you prefer to see decline in brain volume or something like that? No, no, I'm a big fan of uh, of uh, function actually. So I think what is ultimately relevant for the patient is not also is not cognition per se. I mean, whether your memory or your executive function is is stable or not. Ultimately, what it what it's really about is function. So what I like is is measures that take cognition and function at, at the same time. We have developed ourselves a cognitive function uh, score, but it's there are many out there that actually look at function. And I think we should spend some more time in in um, developing proper tools to measure each and everybody's function. Because I mean, you all know, I mean, your memory may be poor, but as long as you can do your work and you can actually function, I mean, that's not a big issue. But when function is impaired, 
then it really becomes an issue. I think so for me, a predictor of functional decline would be most valuable. And I think for MRI, for instance, uh, is very robust uh, showing hippocampal volume over time or whole brain volume over time. That's all fine. And they probably correlate also with cognition and hope and also a little bit with function. But the ultimate measure is for me is function. Uh, thanks. If I could, if I could pounce on that a little bit, I was, um, uh, I was going to just sort of, in a way, declare my position, which is, I, I feel like um, uh, the issue of whether or not the difficult issue of whether or not people will decline is partly, um, partly due to the issues around things like cognitive reserve or brain yeah. reserve, yes. uh, and the degree to which people such as the as the Swiss professors, I think that you referred yeah. to, you know, presumably they would have high cognitive reserve as well as yeah. as well as as well as plenty of antibodies, perhaps. Yeah. So I wonder how those things uh, interact. And for me, I think I would tend to always uh, view, take the view that the convergence on neurodegeneration is actually where you see the process uh, demonstrating what will you know, decline effectively, that 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 is the ultimate cause, surely, of the loss of function. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree, and and um, the, the yeah. So the problem here is that we all know that that such a thing as brain reserve does exist, and resilience exists, and and that uh, sort of education has something to do with it, and brain volume has something to do with it. But there's no real sort of, uh, to my mind, there is no real um, single measure that actually can predict uh, your resilience or your amount of, of reserve capacity, but it does really play a role. And I think here again, as I've seen it, I mean, many of the MRI studies have shown um, some, yeah, some elements of, of volumes. Actually, interestingly, we have a, a project where patients, um, what you see is actually, and I have to say it right, is that on if you compare um, groups of patients with high education versus low education, and at the same cognitive endpoint, the ones with high education have actually more atrophy. So they can, they could, they could endure mm -hmm. a lot of the changes before actually it, it happened to them. And that's all brain atrophy, I think, and that's all mm -hmm. a brain reserve. Yeah. So I think I think I will take that as a bit of a challenge because I, as I think I've said to you, we're, we're interested in measuring a kind of uh, an estimate of quality as well as quantity. Yeah, uh, in the cortex, and I, I have the feeling that may that may in some way partly address this. Yeah, yeah, perhaps so. Yeah, I could sort of. Uh, I have one guy in our in our lab actually working on on resilience and brain uh, reserve, uh, Rick Olsenkoppel, uh, and I'm I'm happy to connect you with him if uh, because he they they have done some studies on on uh, on brain imaging actually in 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 this population. So. No, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. I think I think Jed, you had a you you were just behind uh, Ian and putting your hand up. Go ahead. Great. Um, yeah. I'd also, like to thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, but um, I'd like to follow up on something you said about timing. So you you mentioned the fact that an eighteen month trial was probably too short to see um, changes. You know, given the kind of fifteen to twenty five year overall yeah. kind of course of the disease that you mentioned. But of course. Um, although 18 months is maybe on the short side, actually most of the trials are only a few years and even even in the, the very longest trials, they're short in compared to that kind of 15 to 25 yeah. year time scale. And, and um, even, for example, the phase four um, trial for Agihelm, um, it's, if I've understood correctly, it'll be less than a decade, maybe maybe quite a bit less, maybe kind of seven years or something like that. You know, could, could you comment on um, whether that's really long enough? And, and well, I guess... Uh, yeah. yeah. What is long enough? But it also is. I mean, it also depends on the outcome measure. I mean, it's a bit of a, a catch twenty two. So, um, I think you could also say the eighteen months was probably not long enough to measure it with the CDR sum of boxes. I mean, maybe that's a more appropriate way of of mm -hmm. saying it. And the CDR sum of boxes is, as you know, is an interview with the patient and the caregiver. It's very subjective and it's it's really sort of difficult to compare how people do it. There is some monitoring on it, but it's really not well. So it's not even a, I would say it's a hard, it's a hard measure. Like like amyloid uh, amyloid burden, you can measure. You can measure the SUVR. You can actually quantify it if you want. And and the CDR of summer boxes is still yeah sort of your holistic approach almost. So to to see that CDR moving over time with an intervention that removes amyloid plaque and the ultimate effect 
that you want is downstream from that. So it has to really, first of all, you have to reduce the amyloid plaque, then you have to reduce the amount of oligomers, then you hopefully reduce the amount of neuronal damage, and that hopefully translates into a, something that you can pick up through an interview. So I think, and that's why the Lilly study was nice, because I think in 12 months, at least with an instrument that combined cognition and function, they had a readout in one year. So it's always a balance between the time that you have and the sensitivity of the measure that you use. I think there are more sensitive measures uh, that can actually pick up changes earlier on uh, that can be probably meaningful. Yeah, I was excited to see the results of the um, Lilly's uh, Donanamab yeah. trial. Um, one, one thing I'd like to hear your thoughts on though about that is that um, looking at the shapes of some of the trajectories um, they're not quite what I would have expected for a, for a true kind of disease slowing. It looks more like there's kind of almost parallel lines over a large um, period uh, with, with what looks like a kind of delay rather than a, rather than a slowing, a change yeah. in the slope. Yeah, no, true. Yeah, I noticed that as well. I mean, I think, you know, we just don't know enough yet about, about these um, yeah, but I think it also reflects heterogeneity of the population still, although the 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 the, the inclusion was quite fine tuned, but still there is a heterogeneity in in all these patients, even in in uh, in the slope of of decline. I can't explain it otherwise. Yeah. Mm. If if I could ask briefly, just one kind of related question to the the question of timing, um, because I think in a way it seems to me um, that the familial AD setting provides the, the, the best opportunity to do either a very long trial, um, yeah. if that turns out to be needed, or, or to get the timing of a trial right, given the relative predictability of age of onset. Yeah. Um, but actually on your slide about Adjuhelm, you, you, you suggested probably not to look at familial AD. I'd, I'd no. be interested to hear more about that. <laughs> no, no, well, if you if you look close in my heart, I would say yes. Um, the reason I didn't put it because it's I think there is a, a huge population out there that is still relatively young but non-familial. But um, I think the familial cases uh, have not been studied in these particular programs, although in the Colombian kindred there are uh, studying um, uh, one of the monoclonal antibodies and the Diane to you has st uh, studied gantanirumab and also solanezumab. So it has been studied, but um, if you would do it clinically, you would do it on your own ac account because they are not in the in the uh, in the label. They do indeed um, provide a very very meaningful uh, group to study the hypothesis. In fact, um, of using an antibody that yeah basically gets rid of all the amyloid plaques in this population and then you should do it as early as possible uh, by following these patients over time and when their amyloid pet becomes positive then start the treatment or even before uh, that's always a discussion but i do i do agree and i i have these patients we have a, a small cohort of these patients because we are part of the diane uh, cognitive run in study and they are banging on the door and this the, these patients they have no alternative and i would, I would really hope that uh, we are in the position when ema etc etc that we could try and, and treat these patients yes thank you okay another question mario Hi, thank you for this uh, uh, great, great talk. Um, recent uh, neuropathological investigation have revealed the potential overlapping uh, copathologies, including vascular factors, uh, co-aggregates uh, of TDP43 or alpha synuclein in sporadic uh, late onset AD patient's brain that could lead to faster progression or uh, atypical clinical presentation. Yeah. With the advent of precision medicine to develop novel routes of therapeutic intervention, do you think we should go behind the ATN framework and including uh, the investigation of potential additional neuropathologies in uh, patients with AD? Yeah, uh, for sure, yes. And um, to, to what, what I said, so the ATN, um, is I would say it's just the framework, it's just the basis, and it's just to the to make the point that we talk about Alzheimer's disease if at least amyloid and tau are present. 
but it doesn't say that not nothing else can be present and in the majority of the patients over a certain age there is a lot of co-pathology and the nice thing about some of these co-pathologies we can define already in vivo but some of them are not we we cannot we have no marker for tdp43 for instance yet and and we need one uh, we have no real very good, although it be, it's starting to come a synuclein marker, for instance. There is no synuclein PET. There is a quick RT quick test now for synuclein. So we're getting there, but it's in my mind, if you look 10 years uh, in the future, I would say that we, we can dissect the brain of these patients into the different components by using all the different biomarkers and then treat all these different components with precision medicine approaches. And that's ultimately yeah. what my dream would be. Yeah. Yeah. Another quick question is uh, based on my experience in the clinical practice, we identify people with Alzheimer pathology, usually when they present at the clinical centers referring uh, cognitive complaints and, uh, and some symptoms. So in order to identify people with AD pathology as early as possible before yeah. symptom onset. Yeah. In your opinion, what would be the best strategy? Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so the earliest we now can target uh, is the population that still comes to the clinic because they have subjective complaints, but they they test completely normal. So that is the category that we use, that we call subjective cognitive decline. They people they feel that they are declining. They are comparing themselves to their peers and they say, well, my memory is really worse. But if you test them, they're actually really OK. Well, 10 to 15 percent of those already have abnormal biomarkers. So that's a very good group to start with. They are as early as you can get them. The next step would, of course, to go out in the community and test everybody and, and see. But that's that becomes an issue because then you are population screening and there is, yeah. there is no way of doing that because we have no therapy yet. I do think that the availability of blood based biomarkers would help there because you could easily more easily get patients to your research facility and say, well, uh, if you are sort of thinking of joining research and in your family Alzheimer's is an issue, but you're perfectly healthy, we can test you now. I mean, that's that, there, there are ways to do that. We have actually set up a registry in the Netherlands, which is called hersenonderzoek.nl uh, brainresearch.nl uh, and people can sign up. And, and what we see of the 25 people who have signed up, a lot of them have actually are perfectly normal. They have no issues at all, but they, are fear, they have a fear for Alzheimer's disease or anything else as a neurodegenerative disease, and they want to sign up for research. And in those individuals, they are perfectly normal, and you're not going to do a population screening. They come to you still because they sign them up for registry, and those are the individuals that you can have even earlier access to amyloid pathology, but I see no other way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got just time for one or two more yeah. questions. Dimitra, Dimitra, you, you go. Okay, thank you. So yes, my question is that um, in uh, in some brain regions, such as the posterior cingulate cortex, uh, we see low rates of um, metabolic activity with uh, you know better FTG. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they have been reported years before um, the diagnosis, AD dementia diagnosis. Uh, do you think hypometabolism might be might sometimes uh, cause neurodegeneration, or are these two uh, can be both consequences of another cause? Um, so I think so. Hypometabolism, especially in the posterior cingulate, is a very early sign of Alzheimer's disease. I think that's that's mm -hmm. quite clear. Uh, you see it on FDG PET very early on. Um, the question is always how, uh, and, and the posterior singlet is of course, is a part of this whole circuit where the hippocampus is also and the medial temporal lobe is involved. So the explanation has always been, I thought that uh, early Alzheimer's disease pathology already through disruption of the network causes hypermetabolism uh, uh, sort of uh, away from from that particular part because there is not that much plug pathology actually in the posterior singlet. So it's a distant uh, effect. Uh, but it's a very prominent effect and a very early effect as well. And it's not always, if you if you compare it with MRI, of course, it's not because there is a lot of atrophy. It's actually before that. Was that your question? So, so do you think, you know, if we if we think, you know, maybe atrophy precedes hypometabolism or hypometabolism precedes atrophy, or yeah. how, if if the if you support a theory on, you know, how they connect, 
that maybe you know hypermetabolism in one region can yeah. be you know like can kind of be a consequence of this could be neurodegeneration yeah yeah that would be my 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 sort of the, the the order i would say is that you have hypermetabolism first or or actually hypermetabolism and already uh, synaptic dysfunction before you see atrophy yeah okay yeah. thank you great thanks okay so we we we, we need to we need to finish on time um for one, question. one question one, one question one burning question still no <laughs> yeah sure yeah jamie, jamie. Is that he? Did you cautiously raise your hand? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he did. Uh, yeah, my question is. Oh, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. No. Is that any better? No. Is that better? Ah. <laughs> it's a pity. No. No, that's no. difficult. Just at the end. Sorry, Amy. Yeah. No, you technical issues. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so maybe maybe are we are we out of time, Philip? Well, yeah, one I can still do one. I have another meeting, but uh, can come in a few minutes late. Jamie, I have run one over. question. Well, Jamie, hang on. I think Jamie should be allowed. If he can, he, he's in the same office. Yeah. He can run over. Yeah. Yeah. Omar has a question. I, I do, do I? Professor Skelton, but we're going to give Jamie a shot. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Hey, Jamie. <laughs> he's there you go. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Hello. Um, so yeah, my question would be on, um, given that some people are trying to treat with anti-amyloid drugs and some are trying to treat with anti-tau uh, methods, which do you think, I guess it might be a combination of the two, but do you think there's advantages and disadvantages to either? And do you think one might kind of be necessary more so than the other? Uh, oh, that's a tricky question. So. <laughs> Yeah, the most the easiest answer is that you need both, I think. But the question is, uh, at what stage, uh, and uh, where to begin? Um, and I think the most logical part would probably to start with anti-amyloid treatment if there is amyloid present, and then try to remove as much as possible. And at the same time, or a bit later, depending on whether patients have cognitive decline already or not, and where that stage is. I would start with an anti-tau treatment as well. I think ultimately we will have the combination and, and it's it's tweaking the stage of the patient will decide whether or not to start. So what is interesting, so the Diane TU, they presented their anti-tau program and they have two approaches. For the ones who are tau negative on, on tau PET, they will uh, start very early on with an anti-tau uh, treatment and they will use P-tau as a readout because there is no tau yet. And uh, in patients who are symptomatic and who have already tau, they will also start with an anti-amyloid and anti-tau treatment at the same time. All right. so, so do you think that if there's, if there was, if you just treated one of them, then for example, if you just treated amyloid, would that maybe prevent any tau formation, or can that? Do you think that still kind of happens in parallel? Well, that's that's the big issue. I mean, if you if you I mean, I've always learned from Bartos Stroper that the amyloid cascade is not that simple and unidirectional. So it's not that if you have amyloid and you remove it, then there is no tau. I mean, amyloid sort of creates or or initiates also a, a cascade of tau spreading. So it may actually be that if you remove amyloid, the tau spreading still goes on. So you still have to treat the tau as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great, thanks. Hard, right, you know. So, so thanks for that last question. Um, uh, then it all it, it only remains for me to to to, to thank you, uh, Philip. I think you've uh, painted a, a picture of the future, which is perhaps moving towards uh, some description that has been tried in in, in other conditions, often on the psychiatric end of the range, like schizophrenia and autism, where we think about Alzheimer's as much more of a spectrum. And I, mm. uh, given what yeah. you said about the upcoming kind of um, uh, uh, new compounds, new approaches, and new targets. Yes, uh, I'm interested as to what new terminology we might develop to to address these issues around, like you said, synaptic dysfunction, immunity, and so forth. Because it seems to me there may have to be a, a bit of a 
a change to our lexicon as we describe yeah. these things. Yeah, I agree completely. But it, again, it depends on the on the biomarkers to uh, to inform us on the presence of uh, synaptic dysfunction, immune dysfunction, uh, tau present, TDP43, what have you. And I think that's what I like about oncology so much. I mean, you just not look at the tumor itself, but you dissect it in all its genetic and 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 all the other components, and you try to treat each of each of them. Uh, and I think that's where we are heading, and that's why we need companies like yours that are also developing new ways of, of uh, looking into uh, in, yeah into the pathology and using biomarker. I think that's where the future ultimately is. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I, and I hope absolutely that we can contribute to that. As you said, since uh, since 2018, we're definitely in the era of biomarkers. So I, I think we'll we'll continue yeah. to work on our part of that that picture. Good. But um, right. once again, thank you for everything you've done uh, in the field of Alzheimer's biomarkers in general and MRI, I think originally um, yeah. with, with yeah. hippocampal, hippocampal yeah. volume and atrophy. Um, uh, yeah. And of course, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today, yeah. Philip.